Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Sports Exchange. And we have another great episode in store for you. And here on the air is a longtime hockey expert, but now he likes to talk about boxing and he likes to talk about mixed martial arts, Michael Santos. And, Mike, glad to have you on the program. Hi, Scott. It's always good to be back. You're welcome anytime you want. Well, Mike, we're uh, diving into some uh, leather gloves territory, so we're going to talk about the Deontay Wilder and the Tyson Fury fight. First of all, give me your overall analysis of what you uh, saw that night. Wow, well, there's a, there's a lot to talk about. I mean, first of all, uh, the build-up for this fight is like uh, something I haven't seen for probably 20, 25 years. It was, uh, it was a lot of build-up, a lot of excitement. Of course, it was a rematch. Um, but whenever you get this type of competition at the heavyweight division, it, it gets noticed, and I think that's that's what we had. Um, you know, I mean, going through, the, going through the years, at least since, since I've been following uh, boxing, I mean, we had, we had Ali and Foreman and, and another cap, Coast, uh, cast of characters, and of course, then we we jumped in a little bit later into the Mike Tyson era, into the late ni- '80s and into the early '90s, and of course, then Foreman came back. <laughs> who thought? Uh, who thought that he came back from uh, making hamburgers on his grill to to uh, fighting in the heavyweight division again? Then we had Holyfield, who was the king for quite a while, Lennox Lewis. And then for the better part of about 20 years, we had Vladimir Klitschko. But, um, but it's been a long time, probably since, uh, probably since my Iron Mike Tyson was the king of the ring, that we've had a build-up to a fight like we had for uh, Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder. Um, it, was, uh, it was, I think, everything what, that people expected. Um, I was a little put off by the theatrics. Um, you know, the costumes and and all the things that went on before the fight, but uh, it was a little that was a little uh, too uh, rocky, rocky Balboa for me. But um, and of course, uh, we're now hearing that uh, Deontay Wilder is blaming the uh, the weight of the costume for tiring out his legs before the fight. But uh, <laughs> anyways, <laughs> I don't know if you. If you saw any of that. Oh, yeah, I guess that's know. why I'm laughing. I've heard a lot of excuses in my days, but this one's the first in my book. Yeah. Well, it, it was quite a costume, wasn't it? Did you see it? Oh, I'm sure he, How much money do you think it cost him to go ahead and build that costume? I don't know, but he looked like something out of, uh, I don't know, a sci-fi movie or something. And, <laughs> of course, uh, prior to that, we had Tyson Fury being carried in uh, on a throne, so... <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, made, made for made for pay per view stuff, I guess. But uh, but when they finally got down to uh, trading knuckles, it was uh, it was an interesting fight. And I thought that uh, going into the fight, that Fury coming in at two hundred and seventy plus pounds might have been a problem for him. But it actually, I think, was what really helped him win this fight. He um, he just came forward the whole fight and uh, and. That uh, that weight advantage to, to lean on and, and push on uh, Wilder for seven rounds, and uh, Wilder just didn't have an answer. I mean, he he just he just couldn't answer. Fury who just kept coming forward and wow. He, uh, yeah, what's that? Yeah, you talk about Mark Breland stopping the fight, throwing in the towel. You know, you've been around the boxing game, and a guy's getting better. I don't blame Mark Breland for the problems. I think you have a guy that just simply uh, was outclassed in the ring. Mark's yeah, trying to protect him. I think you're absolutely right, Scott. Um, I mean, uh, you know, the, the trainer's there to protect this fighter. Right. right? Um, he's there to train him and get him ready for a fight, but he's there to protect him and got a guy that uh, I don't know if it was confirmed, but uh, everybody thought that uh, he broke his eardrum. And, uh, of course, with his equilibrium being affected, he, he certainly looked for Bobbly for you know, probably the last three, three and a half rounds of that fight. And um, he's at a point where he's probably going to be defenseless and uh, going to take some real serious damage. So um, whether it was his trainer throwing in the towel 
which I thought was a good move, or the, the referee stopping the fight. Uh, either way, I think it was the right move in, in this case. I, well, I mean, think about it. Boxing, guys die in the ring. They do. I mean, I can t- think of how right. many incidents that have happened. The one that al- has always stood out in my mind was the Dooku Kim Ray Mancini fight. That's you know, great. and back then they were going fifteen rounds. They reduced them to twelve. But the amount of damage that a fighter sustains, even during a twelve round match, it's it's a yeah. lot. And of course, we all know about Ram and Ali dealing with Parkinson's disease as a result of just too many punches. So the track record is what it is. There's no question that Deontay Wilder overplayed his hand in more ways than one. And, you know, but I guess that sets the stage for our third fight, the trilogy. And, and I guess yeah. the one thing I've always liked about boxing is you can have trilogies and you don't know how good they are or bad, but many of the trilogies end up turning out pretty well. And this one yeah. here, I believe, will turn out pretty well as well. I guess the only question now is are they holding it in July? Or are they going to wait till September when the Las Vegas uh, football stadium opens up and they're going to play it there? But I think that third fight could be uh, a pretty good fight, though I'll never get involved with any pay-per-view events because the last time I did, my ex-wife pulverized me for spending 50 bucks on Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield, the ear-biting, and yet we were at the first one. So go figure. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, you know, Look, it, 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 it was a good fight uh, from the standpoint of, uh, you know, Fury came in with a game plan and, and it worked. And, uh, you know, Wilder's, uh, Wilder's got a, you know, a, a great reputation for being a one-punch knockout guy. Uh, but Fury just uh, went forward early and, and took him to task. And uh, I don't think there was any chance Wilder would come back in that fight. But as you mentioned, with these fighters, none of them are going to throw in the towel, so to speak, on their own. None of them are going to give up. None of them think that they, you know, the fight should be stopped. But in this case, I think it was it was a good stoppage, and it was it was definitely to protect uh, Deontay Wilder from serious injury. Well, and as far as it, what's that? Oh, that's okay. Go ahead, complete your thought. No, as, and as far as the trilogy that you mentioned, I, I think that's a that's a given. I mean, obviously, it was it was a clause I understand in the contract for this fight uh, that the loser would have the option of uh, of a rematch. And Wilder's already said that, uh, that he wants that rematch. Uh, I don't think that's going to make Anthony Joshua very happy. Uh, but honestly, I, I you know as much as I like Anthony Joshua, I don't think that uh, I don't think that he can. Uh, he can compete in the ring with uh, Tyson Fury, so uh, I think his his title shot will have to wait until the rematch. And to to have that rematch, you know, in July or during the summer, I think is a little quick. Uh, I, I I think we're probably looking at the at the fall. Right. Well, that's what they've talked about too, Mike. That they would be looking at the fall. But remember, back in the day. Years ago, they used to fight every two or three months, not, and then after, a, and then you had two a year. But you know, things have changed. So when you look at, and and you're right, Joshua will definitely get a chance. I think the one thing you and I follow the sport quite a bit, and I had the opportunity many many years ago to interview Joey Curtis, and, and I know you know Joey uh, yeah. went ahead and uh, you know was involved in a quick and was a Michael Dokes. Uh, against uh, was it Mike Weaver? I think it was. Yeah. Called Weaver, that one, yeah. uh, and Joey told me that he was grilled uh, after the Mancini uh, Dooku Kim fight. They mm-hmm. stop it if you see a line of trouble. Only Joey took it to a different level. But you know, when you're an official, it's a thankless job. Is really what it is. And there's yeah, no. no it is. and especially with uh, when you're when you're in the heavyweight division. I mean. These guys, have, they've always been big, the heavyweights, but now they're enormous. Um, you know, I mean, we're talking guys that are six, 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 seven. Right. You know, tip, tipping the scales in shape at 270 pounds. Right. Um, I mean, the, it, it's really amazing uh, when you watch the heavyweights in the ring now. The ring just looks so small. There's there's nowhere for them to go. There, there really is no way to hide or nowhere to get away. 
when that barrage is coming at you. And I think that was the case here with Wilder. Um, he, he, there was just no way for him to catch his breath. There was no way for him to to uh, get his his balance back, so to speak. And uh, it was it was just going to be uh, it was going to be a bad situation if, the, if this fight wasn't stopped. So, any other final observations about the fight? Um, no, uh, other than like, like you, I'm uh, I'm anxious to see the, the third fight. Um, you know, beyond uh, beyond Joshua, who I'm sure will will fight the winner of that fight. Um, I just don't see a lot of competition at the heavyweight level right now. I mean, we had that we had that interesting win by Andrew Ruiz Jr. a couple of years ago uh, against Anthony Joshua, um, where you know, he came out of nowhere and looked like he was uh, supposed to be a tomato can sort of peak uh, opponent for Joshua and ended up coming out with an upset win, which was, uh, which was interesting. But uh, otherwise, uh, the division looks like it's a, it's a three-man division, uh, and I, I think Tyson Fury probably wins the, tri- the, the rubber match here against Deontay Wilder and retains the title for quite a while. And it seems to be the, the way the heavyweights go, you know, whether it was, uh, again, the days of Ali or the days of Tyson. Right. Holyfield, right. Lennox Lewis, and, of course, uh, Klitschko, who was in the ring for over 20 years. Yeah, boxing needs a heavyweight division, Mike, to even be on the sports map. They really do. The other classes are all well and good. But the heavyweights have been the tradition that that sport's really known by. I mean, I'm not, that obviously that's no indictment against the Roberto Durans, the Marvin Hagler's, the Thomas Hearns, Sugar Ray Leonard's, Sugar Ray Robinson. But you and I both know that Muhammad Ali, George Foreman, Rocky Marciano, J- Joe Frazier. Yep. That's what yeah. made that uh, sport what it's turned out to be. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the, the, the middleweights have had their had their period throughout history. Um, you know, the middleweight division is, is has had some times where it's been interesting and there's been great competition. Um, but the heavyweights are still king. And, uh, uh, and, and when you've got it, when you've got a big fight like the one we just had on Saturday night, it, you see the attention it gets. I mean, it it really uh, it really was uh, a buzz that I haven't seen around boxing for quite some time. Yeah, and in the Detroit area, for those people who are listening, no, I didn't forget about Joe Lewis because I'm mentioning him now. So yeah, but when you you got to get, get your Detroit guy in. There. Oh, you yeah. know it, Mike. Come on, you know it. So all right. Yeah, I heard. Yeah, I, I I didn't miss Tommy Hearns earlier either. <laughs> you, you listen real well. So with that said, we're going to talk about a unique situation that happened over the weekend where the Carolina Hurricanes or the Toronto Maple Leafs could have used, but the Carolina Hurricanes did have an emergency goaler, goalie by the name of David Ayers, uh, winning that 6-3 to three, uh, game over the Toronto Maple Leafs. I know he drives a Zamboni there. He works with the Toronto Marlies. But what are your thoughts about the emergency goaltender being a folk hero? I think it's one, this will go down as one of the best stories of 2020. Yeah, well, I, I think when you look at it that way, Scott, it, it, it is a great story. And I think that's the way people have to have to approach it. Um, you know, I know there's been some criticism of the emergency goaltender rule uh, the last couple of days. But, uh, you know, I've been, in, I've been in those general managers at the NHL level when this topic's been discussed and it's such a rare situation to have two goalies injured in one game um, and what do you do? I mean, you, 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 know, you can't go on without a goaltender. Right. So somebody, you know, somebody's got to step in there. Um, the way the rule is now in the National Hockey League is the home team has to have an emergency goalie on the ready. Uh, and so the visiting team, in this case Carolina, I mean, they really are at the mercy of, of whoever uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs have as, uh, as an emergency goalie. Um, you know, typically they're not uh, guys that have uh, much, if any, professional experience. Right. And that's why you've never seen a situation 
nation where guys come in and actually won a game like David Ayers did. But wow, what a what a you well know, what a fun night! And I, I don't know I don't know really off the top of my head any other way to uh, to handle that type of situation, especially when you're the road team. Um, you know, you just can't you just can't uh, fly around on unlimited supply of goaltenders. And it, and it does happen so rare. This is probably the best way to deal with it. And uh, and what a great story we got out of it. Yeah, unless the team's going to carry a third goaltender on the roster, and I don't know whether that would be smart, but that would be the only way to deal with it. But let's think about David Ayers over a 48-hour period of time. He lands on Golik and Wingo on Monday morning, which I did watch. <laughs> Uh, the late yeah. show with Stephen Colbert is in a bad uh, yeah. uh, act. He's the number one star in the hockey game, and then he's honored in the city of Raleigh, North Carolina. Doesn't get right. any better than that. No, and, and you know what? And, and that's great. Good, good for him. He deserves it. Um, I don't know what the emergency goaltenders get paid. To be honest with you, I don't remember, but it's not very much. Well, I heard it was and 500 they, bucks. Yeah, that's Probably about right, um, but you know what a memory for him, right? And I mean, he's uh, he's like you said, he's a folk hero now, and uh, you know maybe maybe he'll be fortunate enough to get uh, some sort of endorsement out of it or, or something else that he can parlay into uh, into riches for himself. But um, seems to be a great guy. Um, you know, he's taking it all in stride. Um, and I heard an interview with him on the uh, on the radio yesterday. Um, he was saying that his his wife's uh, Twitter account has all of a sudden jumped by the thousands of followers because he doesn't have one. Oh, really? Um, but but yeah, what a, what a lot of fun! And uh, it didn't look good for him there though when he got in there early, Scott. The first, first couple of pucks got by him. And yeah. He, and then he settled down, and he was fine. And uh, I think he made uh, eight, eight out of ten saves. Yeah, he did. So. Absolutely. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I yeah. from what I heard in the locker room, his coach went ballistically crazy. Everybody loved it in there. It was just unreal. But yet, you think about it. You're playing for the opposing team. Okay, you live in Toronto, and no matter what happens, he's going to always have a spot in the Carolina Hurricanes media guide. For the rest right. of his life, and you're talking about the history of a franchise. But now, you've got you're in that with a one and zero record, whatever the goals against the average. He probably don't care anyways. It just he's going to be one and zero, and he will always be in the Carolina Hurricanes media guide. And for me, being in the media for a lot of years, if you're and I've been in a few media guides myself as part of the press, it, it's pretty neat though, that you're part of history, especially any kind of publication. Sure, and um, you know, I, I don't know if anybody has talked about this yet, but it could come down to the Hurricanes and the Maple Leafs for the last wild card spot this year in the big the playoffs. And wouldn't that be interesting if uh, if the Hurricanes edged out the Maple Leafs based on a, on a on a win in Toronto by a emergency goalie that drives a Zamboni down the street? <laughs> Makes you wonder, though, doesn't it, Mike? Now, as I understand this, that Ayers had some kidney problems and that ended his career prematurely. Yeah, I don't know if he was a professional prospect or not, but he did have, uh, but he did have a, uh, a kidney that was actually provided to him from his, by his mother, and uh, so he had he did need a, a kidney re- uh, transplant, and his mother donated the kidney to him, and. Uh, and everything was successful. So, boy, uh, I'm, I'm sure his mom, who I understand is deceased now, was, uh, was looking down on him that night. Was pretty, uh, pretty proud of, uh, of her son. But wow, what a, what a, what a great story! I, uh, I can't say anything other than that. What a great story! And I, I also remember, uh, you know, watching uh, after the, after the first two went in, they cut to the bench, and Rod Brindamore was not looking too happy. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, I think I caught that too. Yeah, but you know what? Uh, I give a lot of credit to uh, to the Hurricanes players. They obviously rallied around him, played well in front of him, and uh, and put some pucks behind the, the the NHL goalie at the other end to 
make sure that they got the win. So it was uh, it was it was great to see the way he was embraced by the other players on that team. And uh, even after he gave up the first couple of goals, you saw players skate right up to him and tell him to shake it off and tap him on the pads and get back to work. And uh, I think that uh, I think that helped. And I mean, of course, he, as I understand it, just came back from. Uh, getting a big sandwich at the concession stand when they called him and told him to suit up. Unreal. Any other thoughts you have on that? No. I'm uh, looking forward to the next one. Well, uh, I actually was uh, I was in a situation uh, a couple of times in Florida uh, once when we had to have uh, Rob Callis, who was the goalie coach, dress for a home game uh, for warm-ups and part of the first period because uh, we were waiting for Jacob Markstrom to arrive by uh, plane. He was called up from the minors and couldn't get there in time. So, uh, so I've had a similar situation, but I can't say I've had a, somebody that I didn't know come into my dressing room on the on the road and step onto the ice and win a game for us, and especially one that I uh, I just know the way things work out in hockey, Scott. This thing's going to come down to the end, and I. I just have a feeling the Canes are going to edge out the Leafs for a playoff spot by a point or two, and that's going to be that's going to be the story of the year. Okay, well we got a few minutes, so uh, the NHL trade deadline came and passed. Were there any things that stood out in your mind about what teams got better, which ones did not? Um, you know, I was really interested to see that nobody really went for what I would consider the big move. Um, I did hear rumblings that uh, the Islanders were trying to add uh, Parisi. Uh, that never happened. Obviously, supposedly Joe Thornton was out there, and nobody went uh, as far as to add him. Um, so a lot of the moves were a little smaller. Uh, I think the Islanders getting and signing Peugeot was a good move. Uh, the, the Tampa Bay Lightning certainly added uh, a lot of depth to their team. Um, interesting, Robert Leonard, um, you know, moving to Vegas gives them some depth. He's a goalie that, uh, of all teams, the Toronto Maple Leafs were supposedly interested in, but couldn't couldn't get a deal done there. Um, and then, you know, the uh, Florida Panthers, uh, our friends in South Florida giving up on uh, Vincent Trocek and really adding nothing to their team at the deadline, uh, especially given the fact that they're, they seem to be fading again right now. That's, uh, that's a little tough to take. Well, how about the dynamics uh, between the Detroit Red Wings and the Edmonton Oilers, how Steve Eiserman yeah. trades the Andres Athanasio and uh, Mike Green, to Ken Holland, so Iserman and Holland connect. You know the green one was a salary dump, and yep. and right now Athanasio is not having that good of a year. So, and yet Detroit no. stockpiling draft choices. Yeah, I mean uh, Steve Iserman. I, mean, I think everybody understood when he went to Detroit that you know this was going to be a process to build up not only his team but probably more importantly his farm system first. Right. Um, you know, that's what he did in Tampa. I mean, people, if they recall, they had that uh, unbelievable team in Norfolk, uh, the Norfolk Admirals, that won 28 games in a row, set a pro hockey record on their way to winning the Calder Cup. And then, lo and behold, in the next couple of years, not only not only several of their players become regulars and, and top players for the Lightning, but so does their coach, John Cooper. And I think you're going to see uh, something similar happen now that Steve Eisen is in Detroit. I think he's going to try to build this with draft choices from the bottom up. And, uh, you know, when the time is right, I think you'll think you'll see him add, uh, the guy that, uh, that he believes is the right coach. Um, and I think if I had a bet on who that guy would be, I, I would bet that it'll be Wayne Lambert. I've heard so, that uh, name. Yeah. Yeah. Former, former Red Wing player and one of Steve Eisenman's, uh, roommates. When they were young players together, uh, a guy that's got a lot of uh, a lot of coaching experience, pro coaching experience, and been an assistant coach in uh, places like Nashville, Washington, and 
and now with the Islanders, you did get some interest last summer, particularly with the Anaheim Ducks. Um, and I, I think he'd probably be the guy uh, when the, when the time is right. So I uh, I, I think Steve Eisenman's got a plan. Um, like you said, Afanasu, I mean, he's, he's a speedy player, uh, but you know probably not going to be the guy that fits in at the time they're, when they're ready to win. And like you said, you know dumping uh, dumping Green right now. I mean it'll help. It'll have Edmonton, who's in a little bit better position playoff wise. And uh, Detroit will just keep moving. I'm sure they'll use uh, they'll use some players from Grand Rapids the rest of this year to get them some experience. And uh, if I know Steve Eisman, that team will be that team will be ready to compete in a couple of years, and then for a long time after that. Were Were you surprised that the Carolina Hurricanes did not trade for a goaltender? Yeah, I think that uh, you know. Maybe David Ayers is hoping he was going to get a contract or something. But, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think so. But, um, you know, understanding uh, understanding since Tom Dundon bought that team a couple of years ago, uh, they're, uh, they're all about bargains and, uh, and not spending a lot of money. And it, it has worked for them so far. So um, I was uh, a little surprised at that. But um, I guess they feel that somehow they'll – the health of their goaltending will get back, and it'll be good enough to get them, you know, get them through the rest of this year. Well, Peter Morazic, think about it—the way he got TKO going all the way out right. to the blue line, only to get leveled. It's not like he made one of the smartest moves I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah, I think that uh, I think that was definitely questionable, especially after uh, you know you've been put in the game because. Your first goaltender has already left the game with an injury, but uh, goalies are a little different, as we know, Scott. They're a little, they're a little different, and uh, I think that uh, I think Carolina will be just fine. They, uh, they're, they're a fun team, and uh, I expect them to find their way into the playoffs again. And when they do, boy, look out if you have to play them in the first or second round. Well, you know, we go back to boxing for a moment. We have like two minutes to go. And Don okay. King used to go ahead and put together a lot of those trilogies, didn't he? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, my he's, goodness. Uh, he's probably uh, you know one of certainly one of the most famous uh, promoters of our time. Yeah. He's not the when it comes when it comes to boxing. Um, but uh, there's been a lot of great trilogies, right? And uh, I mean, probably the greatest of all is, is one that people don't. Uh, you know, average boxing fans don't know about though, and that's Arturo Gotti and Mickey Ward. True. Um, if anybody who really wants to see as good a as good a fights as there's been, uh, that's probably uh, that's probably the best. Um, and then the number of punches those two guys threw in, in three fights, and uh, and all of them went to distance. I mean, amazing. True, truly amazing. Okay. Well, you have about a minute to go. So, if there's anything that you want to promote. Mike, the floor is yours. Yeah, no, Scott. I, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's nice to uh, nice to talk about boxing and, uh, of course, uh, hockey and uh, get away from uh, the Houston Astros for a little while. I mean, that seems to be that seems to be the the top topic, no matter where we are these days. Is uh, the cheating scandal and the Houston Astros, and now, of course, the spring training's begun. We see all the all the theories of uh, how many times they're going to be hit by pitches and get into brawls this year. And, of course, Altuve gets hit first that bad of the spring training yesterday. Um, you know, that's uh, that's probably uh, as much as I can take, and I'll probably have to take it for a couple more years. And then, you know, the last thing, obviously, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention was the, uh, the tribute to Kobe Bryant yesterday. Right. and. Uh, in LA, which was uh, which is fantastic. I can't say that I was a, a person that uh, that liked or just liked Kobe Bryant, but I certainly respected him as a competitor. And um, I did hear something uh, interesting from Colin Cowher today, which I thought was right on right on par with uh, this whole situation. That uh, you know, we we uh, we certainly understand guys like Jordan and even Magic Johnson uh, and the national or international appeal they had, but. But Kobe Bryant was, as I understand it now, such a special athlete and person for L.A. 
that I thought that that was a fitting tribute that they gave him yesterday uh, at the Staples Center. All right, well, Mike, that puts a wrap uh, tonight. But meanwhile, we want to thank you very much for being on the Sports Exchange, and we look forward to having you back on uh, uh, relatively soon. All right, Mike. All right, so take care and thank you. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. Right. Have a great night. Bye. Bye. Well, Candy, I know that boxing is one of your favorite sports. Not, but okay. But with all due respect, well, hey, you got our cats, Bucky and Boots, get into them, and I know how much you enjoy that entertainment, don't you? Not necessarily there, but hey, if it's your entertainment, it's your entertainment. Well, it's a sport that has quite a tradition. Without, nobody can downplay the significance of that. So. No, I understand. I just don't understand why anyone would want to watch somebody else beating up on somebody else until they can't get up. I mean, that to me... That's the definition of like a bully. But, hey, it's a sport. It is what it is. They do it in the ring. As long as they do it, at least in the ring and not any place else. I don't have to love every sport. Um, I have sports that I like that you don't. So it goes both ways. Well, that's true. Not everybody has to love every sport to, to each his own. But with all due respect, boxing has one unbelievable tradition and he had a taste of it on Saturday night as Michael uh, said well I didn't get a taste of it I didn't watch it well I wasn't <laughs> spending 80 dollars to watch it that's okay I was 80 I can find a lot more other uses for 80 dollars well, that's okay I totally get it I totally get it so well you know we've covered a lot of ground tonight uh you know, we talk about boxing uh, coming but up. But now the hockey player, that was kind of interesting. That was kind of fun. David Ayers, yeah. Yeah, that. good for him. I mean, uh, you know, a, a guy that had um, came off literally, when you talk about coming off the bench, he didn't come off the bench. He came He came out from behind the scenes. He, he's a... Um, and he filled in. He didn't do so good the first period that he was in, but the last period he held his own All against right. some tough competition. Well, our next guest is uh, uh, the multi-dimensional David Levin. And David, uh, thanks for being on the Sports Exchange. Glad to have you. Thanks, guys, for having me. On. I don't think I don't think I've ever been called multi-dimensional. I appreciate that. Oh well, it is what it is. You cover football. You cover baseball. Oh, so I might add that to my resume. That that might work. Uh, it might. How's it right? I'll be more. Than, doing down there? I'll be more than happy to give you a good recommendation when you do it. <laughs> okay, I appreciate it. Everybody doing all right down there? Oh, we're, we're doing, doing good. good. How about yeah. you? Um, it's been pouring here all day. Well, <laughs> so, for Florida. So you need you need to come down by us. Yeah, I know, and, and we'll we'll make that happen when you guys get back. And I appreciate uh, everything. No um, so, want to talk a little football? Absolutely. Okay, well, I mean, hey, listen, that, we've been talking boxing. That, that's a better sport for me than we're talking <clears throat> we were talking boxing. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Um, I can't help you. Uh, uh, Roberto Duran, uh, Sugar Ray Leonard, Marvin Hagler. There you go. That's about my extent of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry, guys. Well, you don't have to apologize. I got a Muhammad Ali picture here and uh, right around yeah. here myself. So uh, my jaw is taking nice. a beating over the years. I that you would probably. Re- Realize that my job takes a beating like everything else. So go ahead. Let's talk about uh, the gridiron tonight. <laughs> okay, so um, let's talk a little uh, free agency. Uh, let's focus a little bit on Unique and Gakwe. That's been the big hot topic here. And I know that uh, both Doug Marone and Dave Caldwell got, uh, they got thrown every single angle at the combine today when we spoke with the media after um, it was revealed that somewhere around $22 million a year is going to keep Unique and Gakwe with the Jaguars or, and I preface this because somebody asked me this earlier, that's the kind of contract he's looking for. So it's not specifically known whether it's a statement stating that if Jacksonville is to sign him, that's what he's looking for or that's what he's looking for from any team if he were to hit the free agent market. Um, and I, tell, I need to preface that so that there's clarity there. It's not just the Jaguars. I believe that's just a blanket statement that he believes he is worth $22 million a year. Like you and I discussed earlier, Scott, that would make him amongst the 
the top three defensive uh, defensive ends or pass rushers in the NFL. Um, I'm not so sure he's worth that much money. I know that he is a uh, he's a great talent. You and I have seen him on the. I know Candy's seen him on the field close and personal with, with her with her, with her uh, camera. But is Unique and Gakwe worth twenty two million dollars? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't think so. I have my doubts about it, to be honest with you. Yeah, I, I think he's a great pass rusher, and he has the you know the skills and the moves to be a really really good pass rusher. You know, 37 and a half sacks in four years, uh, 14 forced fumbles. He's he's great at the strip sack, but he's negligent against the run, and that's been his his mo. You know, we've we've read about it, we've heard it, we've even written about it. Um, he lacks in that, that department. So he's not a, quote, complete player. Um, I wonder if the $22 million a year is maybe sour grapes, that he still may be angry with the Jaguars for the way that they handled the situation prior to the start of you know training camp last year. But we also know Tom Coughlin had a hand in that. Um, I'm curious what your take will be on that. Well... The reality is I don't think that he's worth $22 million, regardless of how much cap space that they clear out. You can't put right. $22 million into a guy when you have a lot of needs to fill. And one thing that we should talk about, too, is how many good pass rushers you have in the XFL. And, you know, and, you know we'll find out what other players will be added to rosters come uh, May. Right. I think this is, it, it, you make up a good point. I hadn't thought about that until you just said it. I saw Trey McBride light it up this week, you know, the, the former Jaguar wide receiver. And I, I can guarantee he's going to be on an NFL roster somewhere. I'd like to see him come back to Jacksonville. I don't know if that happens. But there are players out there who are just itching to get back on an NFL field and say, look, you made a mistake, or look at me, I didn't get a look before, or whatever. Um, I can play in this league. I also think that there are other issues, or maybe there are other things that Ngakwe isn't taking into account. Um, his counterpart on the other side, Josh Allen, had 10 and a half sacks this year and made the Pro Bowl as a rookie. Um, and he's a more complete player after just one season. He's better against the run. He's a lot quicker. A um, little bit bigger than, than Ngakwe. I think it's like two inches and maybe 20 pounds. Uh, and maybe that's what the Jaguars use for leverage. Because they can find somebody in free agency or find somebody in the XFL or they can draft somebody. There's some pass rushers that may slip to the second or third round um, that the Jaguars could use uh, in situation, uh, situations uh, with the pass rush. Uh, Dewan Smoot had six sacks this season. Nobody's talking about him. He played inside and out and had a really good season, kind of, you know, under the radar type of thing. There are some... I would say maybe the Jaguars have uh, they're in the driver's seat with this. this is, any, if anything else, they're going to franchise them. Well, that's true. They're going to keep one way or the other. They know his impact. So when are right. they allowed to go ahead and, and negotiate with him? Are they trying to negotiate with him right now, or are they trying to find happy media? I think they're trying to negotiate. I know that Dave Caldwell, when he was asked directly today, and, I, and by the way, I got the transcript at 9 o'clock tonight, Scott, just to let you know. So you might want to check. Okay. Um, you know, remember we were talking about that earlier. Yeah. I got it, got it late. So I was reading it, and he said, out of respect for, for Ngakwe and his camp, I'm not going to discuss, you know, the, what, they've dis- what they have discussed. Um, and I think that's a polite way of saying, you know, so much was made about it in the media before that the negotiations reached a, a, a you know, a breaking point and then they were cut off and then, you know, he took time off and he wasn't in camp and then he said, you know, it's out of my hands and Ngakwe said, you know, I'm just leaving it up to, you know, the God I'm betting on myself and I know my worth. Well, he, he knows his worth is $22 million. At least that's what he says. He said, you know, he thinks it is. I can only see a hand and I can only see three or four teams maybe having that kind of money to shell out to, to pay him. Uh, if he hits the market and wants $22 million. I'm not sure anybody wants to say that he's better than Frank Clark or he's better than Jadavion Clark. Money that's going to be on the free agent market or he is better than um, 
Chris Jones, who can play inside and out for Kansas City. There's a lot of variables there. Yeah, I, I think there are a lot of variables. But, you know, again, it comes back to how much money you're going to allocate for a pass rusher when a team does have a lot of needs. And there could be other choices, as I mentioned, David, in the XFL. No, no, I agree. Um, I also am curious to see what other moves the Jaguars make to free up more cap space. And is that a move to keep him? Are you... Um, are you signing him to a long-term deal, or are you allocating money for other positions? Right. And the Jaguars, the Jaguars released Marcel Darius today. Or it's either today or tomorrow that it becomes official. So that's twenty-two million dollars in save. They also are not bringing back Jake Ryan, and that's no that's no big surprise because he didn't play last year. So there's about twenty-seven million dollars, it's a twenty-five, twenty-seven million dollars that's available in free agency right now. And there are other names that are floating around that could get cut. Marquise Lee, um, they're going to try and work with A.J. Boye, I think, before they decide whether they want to cut him. But if they cut him, that saves them $13 million. They're going to decide what we're going to do with Calais Campbell's contract. And by the way, for some reason, I think they're just going to want to pay him $15 million. I mean, he's worth every penny of it to them. Inside the locker room, on the field, it would be really bad for them to release the NFL Man of the Year. That's, that would be pretty crappy. Um, so they'll work something out. You could see Andrew Norwell being, you know, possibly being released. I think they would try and restructure Brandon Linder. There's a lot of ways to go. But there's a possibility there could be forty or fifty million dollars open to start free agency, and then they can go ahead and, and you know fill holes that they need. And by the way, there is talk so that Caldwell said that they understood that this would be something with Marcel Darius that would happen this year. He would have to have just an over the top season for them to find a way to pay him twenty two million dollars and then he got hurt, remember? Um right. so he he, you know, didn't even factor in. If he's if he doesn't get picked up and he's willing to renegotiate, they did say they would want him back. They might want him back at a reduced salary. I don't see that happening. He's already gone to the well once for them. Um I don't see him doing it twice. Yeah, but what leverage do you have though coming off an injured year? Depending on what kind of shape that he comes in, that's my only question. True, I, I, I want you have to wonder that too. I mean, he's, you know, he's, I, I hate saying this, because I'm going to get ripped by somebody about that. You know, he's a big man, he's a heavy man, he's over 300 pounds. Right. You know, and I don't know, and I, I know core injury. I don't core injury could be a you know, number of things. It's the core muscle around your, you know, the middle of your body. And certain players, you know, um. They react to it better than others. I know that Jalen Ramsey had a core injury um, uh, in his uh, rookie year. The rookie year or second year, where he had to have surgery and he came back and he was fine. There are other players that take longer, you know, to uh, to heal. Uh, Donovan McNabb had a had a core injury. I know playing quarterback and having an injury around your middle and trying to just play through it, I'm, I'm sure is is very difficult. He had a hard time coming back. I guess it just depends on the player. But I would think that if you're a larger player, coming back from injuries like that are probably a little bit more difficult than well, let somebody let, my size. Let alone the fact you know. that he's, he'll be a year older. True. Year older, then, large man. To that too. He's, right. You, you get older, and, and even, if you're, even if you're off your feet, you know, from the you NFL know, standpoint, um, it become, it weighs on you. And no pun intended, but you know, it, well, it, it gets to you. Right. No, that's fine. I, I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I didn't intend to make it funny, but I did. Okay, well, sorry. that's okay. You um, had that uh, quiet sense of humor. Or I low key sense of humor. I try. So, um, I'm also curious to see what the Jaguars now do. There is a story out. Uh, can we talk about this real quick? The Jaguars may be interested in, in Hayden Hurst, the uh, tight end from, uh, from Baltimore. That the Baltimore Ra- Ravens, who have, looks, looks like they have. 50,000 tight ends on their their roster um, are possibly willing to trade their first round pick from 2018 and there are f- at least four or five teams including Jacksonville that are interested. Hurst is a curious case because if he had been on the board at, at number 29 they would have taken him over Taylor Bryant. Mm-hmm. Similar to if Josh Allen was off the board at, at seven last year they would have taken TJ Hawkinson right. of your Detroit Lions. I like 
the idea, but I'm wondering how he fits given he has been given opportunities to play a significant role in the in the Ravens offense, which is, you know, his run pass option and Lamar Jackson and throwing the ball all over the field and making it happen. And he's third on the depth chart. So does he need a fresh start where he comes in? Because he clearly the best tight end on the roster if he if he is signed. And he's better than any of the guys on our roster right now. Coming home, he's a he's a Jacksonville product, went to high school here in Bowles, and um, grew up here. Was an all SEC performer in South Carolina. Does he necessarily make the, the tight end position better? And does that mean they don't look for another tight end either in the draft or free agency? Well, I could see that. Yeah, I mean, if he's a local boy, uh, that's pretty good. Then why not? I mean, you know, right now the Jaguars need whatever weapons they can uh, surround. Nick Foles or Gardner Minshew with. So, uh, you know, you can never have enough good tight ends. Or I just don't think, I mean, how uh, great tight ends don't grow on trees, however. No, they don't. Um, Not like this guy will put too many I, bodies in the stands either, but it doesn't matter. Well, you know, it's, it's not, it, it, I, was, I was thinking about this. He's a local kid. He, he looked... I'm not going to, I'm going to draw the comparison. Gardner Minshew has a certain look. You know, he has a certain persona. And he puts butts in the seats. And I'm pretty sure that that's going to factor into to what goes on this summer. Although they did say today at the combine, they're going to let both quarterbacks play it out for the starting job. Minshew puts butts in the seats. And he, he's, he's got moxie and he wins. You look at Hayden Hurst, he is a redhead with long hair. And a, and a goatee, and he looks the part, and maybe maybe some of that magic wears off, and people want to see the local boy do good. Maybe that does put butts in the seats. And I'm just I'm thinking out loud because the Jaguar sure as heck need something. I've always <laughs> thought the go- I've always thought the one guy that could put butts in the seats, even though we'll never know, never see it, would be Tim Tebow. Okay, he would have. That's not even a. That's not even a question. He would have. And when he was given the choice of deciding between the Jets and the Jaguars, he chose the Jets because he wanted to um, promote his, his his foundation. He thought being in New York and the Big Apple was a great thing. Right. I think that from a from a from a career standpoint, he committed suicide. Oh, no doubt. Because he could he could have he could have played in Jacksonville and he could have stunk, and he still would have been the greatest thing since Grits. Well, I wrote been better than Mark Brunell and. You know, I wrote on that and yeah. sent Dan Edwards uh, a copy of my column, and actually Dan sent me a very complimentary letter uh, saying I really enjoyed yeah. what you wrote. And you know, Dan, and and you know, again, Dan and I are good friends, anyways, and I hope he's doing okay. Mm-hmm. And I know we'll see him in a couple of months, but but yeah. Dan, I wrote on that same thing. It was career suicide. He was sold by Rex Ryan. Living the dream. Funny, he was sold Rex Ryan, but the ownership group didn't want anything to do with him. It was kind of weird um, because at this press conference, nobody went with him. He was the only one there. He walked out there by himself. Right. He took on the media by himself. There were no handlers. There was nothing. It was it was bizarre. Rex Ryan to me is probably the best salesman I've ever seen. He could have sold cars and look legitimate. Is what he could do. Rex could sell anything. Yes. He sold a wildcat <laughs> to a Gator who should have been playing in. Northern Florida. But you're right. Career suicide is indeed what uh, Tebow did. You know, I think he's made up for it, though. You know, in other other areas, I think he's doing just fine. Yeah, but, you know, know, again, you'll never know what he could have done on the football field because he made the moves that he made, but regardless. Right. But talking, putting fannies in the seats, well, go figure. I, you know, I, one thing that, did, that I've noticed this week, and it, 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 I know that we've talked about this quite a bit, the discussion about London has really quelled. It has stopped a little bit. People aren't as adamantly mad about it as they were the last few weeks. And, and it's, it's been a topic that has been flammable. And I think, that might, I think that's a good word for it, because once you talk about leaving London, then you're mad. And now they're talking about free agency, and people are shifting to, okay, who are we going to bring in? Who are we keeping? What is our draft going to look like? People are starting to understand 
there's more to it than just leaving, you know, going to London. It, it, and, and I was hoping it would happen like this. I know people are still mad. I'm curious to see how many people really do renew their seats and how many season ticket holders they get. But I think people are really starting to understand that in order for this team to stay here, you know, towards, you know, 2030, and I'm using that as a marker, that they have to go to London now. And um, it will be um, it will be the fans' responsibility to understand that it's not just about throwing the football around. It's about the sustainability of, of an organization. Because if the Jaguars do leave, the city of Jacksonville takes a huge economic hit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well... I don't think you... Yeah, it's, it's a big deal. Yeah, but you're right. The only chance they have to stay in Jacksonville is by playing two games in London as it stands. Let's not forget once upon a time the Green Bay Packers used to play three games at Milwaukee County Stadium, right, Candy? Yep. And then they played five in Green Bay. So, In fact, they still have... They, they did that quite a bit, though. I mean, that, that, isn't, that isn't like ancient. That's still fairly new, isn't it? I mean, that's still recent. It it was no, it was back um, before they built Miller Park for the Brewers. So it was back when they had okay. County Stadium, right. it's a multi-purpose but, stadium. Yeah, it was a was okay, a multi-purpose gotcha. stadium. But they what they did is because there were season ticket holders for Milwaukee, they now designate three games of the current season to those Milwaukee season ticket holders. Oh, well, that's cool. Yeah, that, that's. Here's the thing, too, with cities like that, and I'm not talking about necessarily the city, um, the Packers, you know, they're it. In Milwaukee, they've, they've got, you know, the Bucks and they've got the Brewers, and they've got some other sports, but in Green Bay, that's it. And it's a small, it's a small, it's a small community, but there's so much nostalgia there. Unlike Jacksonville, remember, Green Bay and Jacksonville are two smaller markets, smaller markets, smaller Markets. Sorry, right. I can't speak tonight. That's all right. <laughs> well, but you got to remember, but, though, but, David, that Lambeau Field had to be uh, brought up to NFL standards. Right. And that's why they play. And then, of course, they wanted to open up the team to a larger metropolitan area. I'm going to tell you right now, David, that covering a football game over at Milwaukee County Stadium was a big, huge nightmare. It, because that press box wasn't built for all of us, anyhow. And the locker rooms, it, it was a tough place yeah. to work out of. It really I mean, was. Since I have never, I've never been, I've never been to Milwaukee. I, I've never been to Green Bay. I'm going to take your word for it. You need um, to go. Well, you need uh, to go, oh, I, I, and you need to go this year. I, I, we'll be there. I know. I, well, we, we've talked about this. <laughs> you need to go this year. <laughs> okay, here's the deal. We don't want it in December. <laughs> well, whether you want really it or not, it's December. a possibility. What, you don't want to see snow. I know it's a- um, I want to, you know what, it, I want to see snow, I don't want to fly in it. How about that? <laughs> you won't know the difference. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I don't want to fly in it. <laughs> ah, well, I don't worry, I've done it many. You won't know the difference as long as you're on the inside and out on the outside, you'll be all right. But this you, is true. This you, is know, true. We need, you and I and Candy uh, need to uh, hang out up in Green Bay. We'll go to Kroll's West. Is that one of the restaurants up there, Candy? What? Yeah, I, you know, I, West. I, I, I'm losing my tan right now. I'm pretty, will be, I'm pretty sure I will be stark white if I stay there for a whole week. I'll come back and be like, "What happened to you?" I'll be like, "Green Bay." Well, <laughs> well, what happened was you got immortalized in real football, knowing that there's so many things to see in the Green Bay area. The uh, what Green Bay Packers Hall of Fame, the stadium. It's, it's a cool place. You go by the Lombardi statue. I can't wait to get back there later this year. Let me share this with you real quick. Sure. Um, you know, I'm from, I've been here in Jacksonville for almost 40 years, and um, Leroy Butler, who, who played for Green Bay and is, is, a, is a local legend here, I asked him about that because he grew up in Jacksonville, and, you know, it's hot. It's, it's you know, it's blistering hot during the summer. And uh, he was at Florida State, too, and he uh, graduated a few years before me. I said, listen, he was a charity fan. I said, what's it like playing in Green Bay? He goes, if you're winning, you get used to it real fast. <laughs> well, right. That's true. He said, he, he, he goes, you deal with it. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> it's exactly what he said. So, um, 
I'll take his word for it because they were very successful when he was part of that team. Um, well, so. years ago, Dan Devine, when he didn't win up there, had his dog killed. Oh, gosh. So That's a, that's a blast from the past. Well, I, I had a history of Jeez. talking about... Yeah, Dan Devine, he, he coached the Packers, and uh, yeah. his dog was killed when they didn't win, so that just shows you how uh, passionate they are for all the right or wrong reasons. Wait a minute, wait a minute. This took a turn that I don't think I would like. <laughs> Maybe you don't. Know. <laughs> okay, oh my gosh, now now she pipes up. Okay, I got you. Yeah, there Come you on, go. Leroy Butler, famous for the Lambo Leap. Yes, I believe he is the first one to do that. He is. It was either him or was it him or Ed, Edgar Bennett? No, it was I him. It was one of the two of them, and they're both. Yeah, so that's very cool. Jacksonville guy. Well, let me tell you, you, you get up there and you have to see the Vince Lombardi statue because I got news. No, I'm, I'm, I'm all, I'm all in. I really, I'm all in. Just you know, five pairs of Long Johns, some brandy in the coffee. Um, we're good, guys. <laughs> well, well, let me tell you, I covered games over at Soldier Field in Chicago and right off the lake, and I tell you, I had to wear three pairs of socks, a nice uh, pair I, of uh, been, okay, hiking been, Okay, I've wait a minute. Soldier. Wait a minute. Time out, no, guys. I've been to Soldier Field. I know it's called there. Time out, guys. This is coming from two that sit in the press box. They're enclosed right. either in air with heat, not down on the field like me. I was on the. What are you talking about? Wait a minute. Back in the day when we were allowed on the field, okay. For what? Five a whole to seven five minutes? minutes? <laughs> big deal. Try the whole game. Uh, well, all right. I, I know you're a photographer. You definitely get more exposed to the elements. I know that, but for God's sake. Yes. Kitty. Yes. He's a delicate flower. Leave him alone. Uh. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> hey, I've been for the, uh, the truth comes whole out. other wars over the years. There's nothing like sitting there, standing at Soldier Field here, guys. Now I'm getting ganged up, but that's okay. I have no problem with it. <laughs> since Candy's I, I come this, alive. I know this, I know this is going to sound crazy, okay, but here it goes. I'm 12 years old. 12 or 13, 12, yeah, and I'm living in Atlanta, and I know that Atlanta is nothing like Green Bay, okay, but I've never been to a high school football game, okay, it's not, it's not, but it's in, it's in, it's in late November, and I have never been to a high school football game, and it just so happens that's the first time in 20 years that it decides it wants to snow in Atlanta, and, and my dad still wants to go to the high school football game, because for some reason, Norcross High School hasn't been in the playoffs in forever. I couldn't feel my body. And I know that doesn't mean anything, but that, that was my first introduction to a really cold weather. It was like 13 degrees outside in Atlanta, and it was freezing, and it was it, it, literally the snowflakes were coming down. And I thought I was going to, be, going to die at a football game. I'm pretty sure the people in Lambeau wear T-shirts or nothing, at, you know, no shirt or whatever in that weather and enjoy every minute of it. <laughs> they do. They are crazy fans. But I, I will admit yeah. that a wet cold is, is cold is yeah, it was, it's, down to your bones. And, it, you know, if you've been to Atlanta, it's, a, it's not a snow. It's a slush. So it, right. it makes it worse. So but that was my first real experience with snow and cold weather. And I honestly thought I'm going to die at a football game. It was a traumatic experience at 12. <laughs> well, let me tell you. Uh, when, when I covered games at Soldier Field right off of Lake Michigan, and it was freezing like you wouldn't believe. Yeah, yeah I've been to Lambeau. But I'll tell you, one of the more inter- interesting places to cover a game is Candlestick Park in San Francisco when it's there's a big downpour and you're trying to keep your footing on yeah. the field. And it's and it, it's cooler because of the breeze and, and right on the bay. I, I, bet, it's, I bet it's not yeah. um, the most comfortable experience, to say the least. Um, kind of makes kind of makes fifty degrees in Jacksonville seem pretty warm, doesn't it, Scott? Oh yeah. Well, like I said, I've covered a lot of games <laughs> at a lot of stadiums over the years, Mister yeah. Eleven and Miss Candy. And well, let me tell you, they're all interesting in their own way. I even covered a game in Se- I even covered a game in Seattle, but luckily it was in, in, in the Kingdom, so I can't say anything about the rain out there. You can't say anything about Detroit either because you're inside. Well, that wasn't always the case. I, I uh, watched no, games. Right. It wasn't always the case, but I'm going to assume you have been to your fair share of indoor games in Detroit. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, I have. Ford Field, yeah, okay, Silver, Dome. Silver Dome. But Tiger Stadium yeah. was an outdoor facility, brother. That, no. That's a summer game, though. No, no, it, no not when it came no, to no, the no, NFL. No, 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 no,
No, that's true. In, in April, no, but I'll tell you what. In baseball in April in Detroit can be still can still be pretty darn cold. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, but I've I, seen the I, Lion you know. game. Wait a minute. Hey, I, Brewers I, had the same thing. I've seen Lion games during the fall, and let me tell you, it gets pretty. It gets pretty cold over there too. I have to okay. say, you wouldn't know what it's like to have so a blanket inside the right press now. box. <laughs> no, I, well, I never you know. covered a game for uh, the Lions game in the press box at Tiger Stadium. No. no All I, I did at Tiger Stadium was okay. watch a guy by the name of let's Chuck cir- Hughes dying. We deviated in front of me. again. We deviated yeah. again. Let's, oh, let's, cares. Circle, let's, circle, let's circle around here, guys. All right, um, go ahead. <laughs> Where are we let's circling to? Let's, let's, let's close this up. Let's, uh, let's, let's, let's do this. Get back to the Jaguars. I believe okay. that in the, in the, okay, let's do this. In the, in the next few days, because they can't franchise unique until Friday. And by the way, they have two or two or three weeks to get that done. Just because it, it, they're, if he's eligible on Friday doesn't mean that they're going to do it on Friday. I still believe that they're going to try and offer him a deal. I just don't know in my head, five years in an average of $22 million if this kid is worth it, especially if he signs that contract. And I believe the Jaguars still wind up overpaying him to keep him. Then Josh Allen goes out, and not only does he have 10, 10 and a half sacks in his rookie year, he gets 12 in his second year. And then they go, oh, God, what do we do? If Unique doesn't have double-digit sacks in 20, and Allen is you know running over people and three people to get to the quarterback, there's 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 a lot of layers to this that you got to peel back and determine whether you're really making the right choice. You know? Right. Well, that's true. So... So in the end, uh, you were talking about will the front office uh, make the right moves uh, this off and right off season with free agency and the NFL draft to show for what they're serious about winning. I want you on twenty twenty. Go ahead. Why don't you give me your overall synopsis on that? Okay. Well, I, I I do like. I'm not crazy about the idea that they 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 let Darius go, but they had to. I, after reading the trend, and you'll read it, you'll see what he said. They still believe they have flexibility with free agency. They have a plan for the draft they're working on. If they were to trade for Her- for Hayden Hurst to bring in a a legitimate tight end that can compete and, and can play, you know, I still think that James O'Shaughnessy, um, Kelsey, because he looked good those first five games, and Nick O'Leary, not Josh Oliver, and somebody like Hayden Hurst gives the Jaguars three decent tight ends. It's, it's not going to be a Tony Gonzalez or Antonio Gates situation. It's never going to be that way. But they at least need three people that can catch a football across the middle and do a little bit of blocking. Um, everything is reliant on what they do. And the two positions they have to fill is defensive tackle and a tight end. And then they fill the other spots in. The linebacker, I guess, is slurred. And then you can pick what you want, whether it's cornerback or finding another running back to compliment Leonard or finding a speed guy on the outside. But those two positions have to be filled. And I think that that's the, that's the direction they'll go. Um, they're going to, like I said, they're going to let the quarterbacks play it out. Doug Marone said that he is definitely taking more of an active role in player personnel um, than he has. And the whole staff is doing that. So those are encouraging things. So there's a, you know, if you want to take it for what it's worth, and I know it's it's coach speak and it's in front of a camera and it's kind of rehearsed and whatnot, it gives you a sense that they have their, their ducks in a row and they're working together and they're not having to battle the middle man. And we all know who that was. That coach and head coach, coach and general manager are on the same page. That's a good thing. Yeah, they're on the same page right now, Mr. Eleven, because their jobs are on the line. So, well, yeah. I, was, I was waiting for you to say that too. I kind of like, I kind of baited you. So yeah, well, you did you bait me. So now that I've Jump said in. it, I'll just say Jump Doug in. Marone should go ahead and have more say in the personnel because it's do or die for him. Call well the same thing. So, and of course, I'm sure Trent Balky's in the background, you know, with his eyes on these two guys. But you know. <laughs> Here, here's something that I didn't discuss with you before that I want to throw out there real quick. I know we're, we're going up on, on the end not, here. Fine. Last year, when we, right before the draft, and they had the draft breakfast luncheon, and the local media comes in and talks, and they ask questions. Dave's on one side, Doug is on the Doug is in the middle, and Tom is on the other end, and they're asking questions back and forth, and we're all asking questions, and Doug is in the middle, kind of like just sitting there. Tom would ask a question, 
would answer a question. Dave would answer a question. They'd go back and forth. And Doug kind of like, you know, just bobbing and weaving there. And then finally he gets a question. It's almost by design. It was like, we'll handle this. You just coach the players. You know, this time, I really want to hear what Doug has to say. I want to know what he's thinking. I want to know if he's going to coach them, he should have a say in who comes in here. Right. And I'm curious how much, I'm curious how much he, because I, I know that Di Filippo was involved in it. How much influence did Doug Marone have in bringing in Nick Foles? Right. You know, those type of things I want to know. So let's hope we can find out this time. Well, yeah, the bottom line is, is I think in a make or break here for Marone, he should have a lot more say in personnel matters. And I think that uh, I'd be, and for no other reason, I'll be curious to see how his talent evaluating and shopping for the groceries mentality fares. Yeah, if you're going to go out, you might as well go out with that in mind. Without right. a doubt. Because if, if you, by God, if I'm going to, if I'm going to, if I'm going to die on the sword, I'm going to do it my way, essentially. Oh, yeah. And that's, you know, that should be the, that should be, I guess, his mentality for this year. Well, okay. Well, I agree with you. We'll see how it plays out. So, all right, David, Oh, before we wrap up the broadcast, why don't you promote everything that you represent? Um, I'm a family man. No, seriously. Uh, <laughs> I write for uh, for fan side. And I, uh, I can be found writing uh, football and baseball. I am on Twitter at EM719907. Okay, well, on behalf of Candy and I, uh, we hope that your dad gets a lot better. I know he's uh, not you. feeling very it. well. Yeah. So. And we're doing, we're, we're doing well. Yeah, I well, that. I hope he's proud that his son uh, is a broadcast partner in the South Florida Tribune Broadcasting Network. And for those of you uh, viewer that are listening, uh, look for the uh, South Florida Tribune on Twitter at Tribune South. You can like our page on Facebook. And I also have a YouTube channel as well. So if you have a Gmail account, feel free to follow South Florida Tribune as well. So meanwhile, on behalf of uh, Michael Santos, who led off the show, and our closer, David Levin. Uh, we look forward to another episode here of the Sports Exchange. So, David, once again, great work, and we will talk to you real soon. Good night, David. Talk to you guys next week. You bet. Sounds good.